I hear the Lord saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And did not I say that if you would believe in me, that you would see my glory? My glory is in the midst of you. We've got glory dust right there. I just said we don't have it anymore. My glory is in the midst of you. So I say, believe. Believe that I am. That I'm in the midst of you. That I'm in the midst of everything pertaining unto you. And as you will believe, you will see my salvation happening in your family, in your situation, says the Lord. I will raise those things from the dead that are not. Those areas that are completely dead and lifeless, I will bring life to them, says the Lord. I will bring vitality where nothing exists. Those dreams, those visions of yours, that were dead you have observed that there's no life in them but if you will believe you will receive my glory my resurrection power I will make them happen I will make them live again I will make you live again says the Lord or I will take that which is dead that which is dry that which is lifeless that which is hopeless and I will give you a living hope and it will become your material reality if you will hold fast to your profession of faith and believe you will see my resurrection power that those things that you dreamed those things that you desire that you did not see materialize I say they are not dead. They will live. You will live. You will have what you dreamed. You will have what you envisioned, even though it seems like a dead dream, a dead vision, dead and impossible thing. I will breathe my life in it, says the Lord. I will bring it to pass. I will cause it to rise. It will come forth out of the grave. It will come forth out of the very tombstones that you buried your dreams. You buried your vision. You buried your hopes and said, I have no more hope. I did not give you something that is dead. I gave you something that is alive and I will breathe life in you. I will breathe life in your family. I will relieve. I will bring life into that which you will believe me for. You will see my glory in an explosive and expansive way as you will place your unwavering faith in me as the resurrection and the life. For as I live, did I not say you will live also? And everything that pertains unto you is life. I have given you abundant life. I have given you eternal life. I am alive forevermore. And I will give you life in those things that seem to be dead works. They will live again. They will rise again. Those hopes will live again. Those dreams will come alive. That vision will materialize, says the Lord. And I will save. I will heal. I will build, I will recreate, I will do new things for you, even though you said it's past that point of possibility. Stand up and trust in me and believe in me and receive that which I am, for I am the resurrection and the life. I am your life. My life is in you. My life is around you. And I will cause you to obtain that which you will believe me for. You will see my glory. And I will favor you and give you great grace even in the midst of all that you have experience is negative, I will turn it around for you 
and you will see positive results where I'm the living God doing living works, not dead works. I will do it, says the Lord, for the honor and glory of my great name. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's really hard sometimes when you have to wait. Waiting is not something that we like to do. It seems like in our lives, we spend more time in the waiting room than we do the reception room. Anybody experiencing that? That you had to wait on God. When you're trusting in God, then oftentimes what you want him to do, what you expect him to do, what you're praying about, what you have believed him for, is not materializing. You have to wait for it and wait patiently for it. And, and in America or around the world, even we have lost that ability to have patience. We want instant answers to complex problems. We want divine intervention that's real and material right now. We don't want to wait for anything. We want God to move now. We want doors to open now. We want things to materialize now. We want the vision that he said, wait for it, because it will surely happen. Write the vision, make it plain and simple. And then when you write something, don't just throw it in the corner. Look at it. This is the vision that God gave me. Well, it didn't happen yesterday. It's not happening today. I don't think it'll happen tomorrow either. Wait for it to come. It'll surely happen. If God gave you a word, God's word will not fall to the ground. God is good for his word, and good is the word of the Lord. God's word is not a bad word for you. It's a good word for you. And so we need to sometimes write it down. This is what God told me. What about Abraham the believed God that was counted unto him for righteousness? He received that righteousness through faith in God's word for him. That he was one that held fast to that 25 years before he received his miracle child. And it was a miracle. Sometimes if God would give you what you ask him for, you would attribute it to somebody else or something other than God. But when God brings your vision and your miracle that you hoped for to a point where it's impossible, then he's the only one that can fulfill it. He's the only one that can make it happen. He was the only one that could give Abraham the promised seed. He didn't say seeds, he said seed. 25 years he waited until it was no longer possible for Sarah to conceive and carry and birth a child. It was past the point of possibility. 25 years old or later than it happened, he's 100 years old, that she conceived the promised child or had the promised child and embraced it. Well, how many times have we had to wait on God to do something that he promised us? Then you get to thinking, well, I'm not sure that that vision came from God. I'm not sure that that was really the word of the Lord because it hasn't happened yet. When he said to write the vision, make it plain and simple. You don't add to it. You don't subtract to it. If God speaks to you and tells you something, go ahead and write it down because you know when he speaks. You don't want to add your stuff to it and you don't want to take anything away from it either. Just make it very plain and simple. And then what do you do? You look at it. Well, it hasn't happened yet. You know, a year has gone by, two years has gone by. Nothing's happened, nothing's changed. 
my family's not saved, or I've prayed for them and I believe for them, or, or this never changed and nothing's happening, this vision's just not taking place. He said, wait for it. Wait for it, for it will surely happen. And when it happens, it'll happen suddenly. Now, doesn't that seem like a reversal of what he says when he tells you to wait on it? Wait on the vision, but then when it happens, it's going to happen with speed. Bam! There it is. You know, you waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and nothing, 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 nothing. Bam! What is a biblical example of that? The prophet Elijah goes up on the mountain. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. You know, prophets here. He could hear the sound of a month's nuts of rain. There wasn't a cloud in the sky for three and a half years. There was drought in the land. People were starving to death. There was no seed time and there was no harvest. There was only drought time, starvation time. The animals were dying and dead. There wasn't any food in the land. People were in a very difficult place, God allowed that famine to take place. Prophet came, said, hey, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Went up on the mountaintop, he prayed, sent a servant, go look. Go look over yonder while I'm still praying. Then he goes over, nothing. Go again, nothing. Seven times, seven times, well, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. What is that? That's not gonna end the drought. God said, let's get out of here, you know, because even though it had been three and a half years of drought, even though he prayed seven times, even though nothing happened, that little tiny cloud ended up being a huge mass of rainstorm. Let's get out of here because the rain will prevent us from getting down from the mountain. So they got down off the mountain before they even got down. And it's just raining cats, dogs, puppies, and kittens. Well, not in reality, but that was gone. I was in Uganda for. I don't remember which mission it was. I think it was the fourth or fifth mission, not remembering. Um, I, I can't remember which mission it was, but I was there. They were having a drought on their airwaves and they were telling about the drought. You know, the, the, and you would go through the fields, by the fields, and see all the matoki trees were brown. They, nothing was growing, no rain not in the rainy season, no season. And they were afraid that there would be famine because they exist off of the matoki. Matoki tastes almost, kind of almost like potatoes. It's, you know, it's not, it looks like bananas and green bananas, but they are not, they're not plant gums, they're different. But um, that's their main state. And everything was dried up. I went to Western to see all these fields of ground everywhere and I went to this one place and as we have the spiritual rain I was sitting there outside in an outside venue I just saw a light fall right there um I'm in an outside venue and I felt a drop of rain that the sky is perfectly blue not a cloud in the sky so I knew it was spiritual rain and we have rain here that's nothing to do with with physical rain. So I got up and I prophesied that it was going to rain. There's not a cloud in the sky that had drought. Everybody, it's on the airways. Everybody's afraid. And I prophesied that it was going to rain. And I said, the sign of that is I felt a drop of rain on me. It was spiritual rain. And I have this and I carry this, but it's going to physically rain here. And I said, but it's not going to rain immediately because we came on these dirt roads and we're going to be here for a little bit and then when we leave we've got to get back off of these dirt roads or the rain will prevent us there will be big mud and whatever and, and keep us from our journey so i said it's going to rain 
as I lit up, before we got off of that road, it started to sprinkle. There was rain on the car, so before we could even get off. And I got the message the next day that they just had this great big amount of rain. It just rained and rained and rained. And everywhere I went, I prophesied that it was going to rain and end the drought. Every single place that I went, and it rained. I remember one of them that um, had me back uh, the next time I came said, well, we were having a drought and she prophesied rain and boy, it rained, it rained so much. But I went to this one place that was um, very remote in a village and all the Matoki trees, when I went to pray for all of them, every single person there was healed and full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I said, you know, they were afraid because all of their farm was getting ruined and there was no rain. And I said, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. And uh, so we're looking at the skies. There's no clouds at all. And I sent a picture home. I still have that picture. Now, when we were going back into the town, it started raining. You could see the storm clouds coming in. And uh, it, it just, when God does something, I'm trying to tell you that you'll see nothing, no manifestation of anything at all. You know, I don't see any hints, I don't see any signs that God's gonna do this. I'm not hearing it, I'm not seeing it, I'm not feeling it, it just doesn't exist. But we as Christians can speak those things that aren't, as though they were. Speak the things that you desire God to do, that are not in existence as though they were. Just like when I prophesied that it was gonna rain when there wasn't a cloud in the sky and everybody looked at me with non-belief. Oh, it's gonna rain. You know, it's gonna rain. It rained everywhere. It rained in every city that I went to. And I, I, I come against that drought and it was raining everywhere I went without fail. But the clouds were just coming in rolling in, and we did not make it off the dirt road before a downpour. It was raining on us so hard, I was concerned that the drought would keep us from our destination when we left that village. But thankfully, we got to our destination without getting stuck in the mud. But anyway, God is good for his word. We can have a vision in our vision, we write that down. And we believe that God is going to bring it to pass. If we will hold fast to our perfection of faith. If God tells you something, he's good for his word. He's going to fulfill it. And when he doesn't do it in your time frame, because oftentimes when he does something, like I say, if it's possible, then you're going to take the credit for it, or if it's just a circumstance or a happenstance or whatever, and you won't give God the glory for it. That's human nature, isn't it? We can just find a reason not to give glory to God for something that he promised for us when it's still possible. But when you have to wait for it, when it gets to the point where nothing is going to make this happen, nothing will affect it or change it, then you are in line for a miracle. Because God wants to give you miracles so that you know that it's the hand of God that did it. Not some other person, not some other event, not some other thing that could make this come to pass, only God. So he tells us, Write the vision, make it plain and simple, and wait for it, because when it happens, it's gonna happen suddenly. Well, we waited for it, that's not sudden, but then all of a sudden, bam, there it is. <sighs> Look what the Lord has done. We can take this church as a, an example of it when we're looking at the wall being ruined and the rain coming down and we didn't have the ability or the personnel to fix it. But when it happened, was it sudden? Would you consider this sudden? 
that the birthing of America took place, that in nine months' time, from the beginning to the end, this entire church was restored. Unbelievable! That we didn't have the money for the roof, and bam, there it is. And then we needed the foundation done, thirty-some thousand dollars for that. And they didn't come down on it, did they? It was still 33,000 and something, or 32 something, and that was done. And, and then we needed, I wanted these. I, I went online and I looked at these chairs, and, and uh, that's what I wanted for our church instead of the pews. And, and uh, that were a lot of money. I think they're, what, 100 bucks right now for one? One chair is $100. And then I went online looking for used ones. And the next day, John looked out in the same place, and here they are, $12 a piece. Bam, we got them. That was God, you know, and that was just one more thing, or, or the carpeting, uh, $14,000, you know, for this carpeting. We didn't have that, but when God gave it to us, it was sudden. It was a sudden happening. It was kind of a continual miracle. And, and, and a, a miracle for the roof to be done. A miracle for the foundation to be done. A miracle for two brand new heating and cooling systems. Not what we had first been for that would just replace them, but an upgrade of something that's going to... Is anybody too hot in here right now? Because we have air conditioning and it comes up fast. Remember sweating and fanning and, or freezing to death and we don't have that anymore. I can come in in the morning and turn the heat on when it's 40 degrees in here and by church time, we're gonna have it nice and warm. Is that true? And we, I don't have to sit and pray about it. Like I would pay some prayer, oh Lord, if we'd only get up to 50 degrees in here, you know, we're passing out blankets and whatever, and, and everybody's freezing, and oh, if we could just get up to 60, oh Lord, help us. You know, we did this for years, but now God gave us these brand new ones, and we, we didn't have it. But when God begins to fulfill his word, when he said that they that be with me won't be prepared the old waste places. They will, and it was years before, I didn't even have a church when he said that. We would rise up the foundations, more than one, of many generations. We would be called the repair of the breach, the restore paths to dwell in. So what he was going to do is something in the physical, because of what he was going to do in the supernatural, it was a supernatural physical happening for us to be able to raise up the foundations of many generations, this church being built in the 1800s. That's more than one generation of people that were here. And he tells me before I ever see this place, those that be with me, we will repair the old waste places. This was a dump beyond. And God was going to restore. So we had the vision. I wrote it down. I preached it a few times. I read the passage of scripture and the years went by. The years went by and the roof leaked and, and the wall was getting wrecked and the floors were nasty. And you know, we did some things. We restored it once, but not the way that we were supposed to. But when it happened, it happened quickly. The rope was done, the walls and the holes were fixed, the cracks were fixed and replastered and repainted and, and everything was done. Everything was done and more. Because when God did it, he did it in a hurry. But what he did in the realm of the physical is nothing compared. It's only a sign of what he's going to do in the realm of the spirit. That we will be the repair of the breach. Restore a paths to dwell in. And we will return to that old path. That tried and true path. That path that seemed to be overgrown. That, that people didn't want to go down that path. That we're going to be the repair of those breaches. Stand in the gap. Repair the breaches and restore that path to dwell in. 
that straight and narrow. It's not to the left, it's not to the right. It's not this extreme or that extreme. It's right dead center in the very, very path of righteousness. And God, what he does in the natural, he's going to do in the spiritual, the supernatural, so that if we see the church restored in the physical sense, he's going to restore in the spiritual sense that he will re repair, revive, restore, and renew. Well, I haven't seen it yet. We ain't dead yet. You know, your vision may be dead, but as he spoke to us prophetically, that he is the resurrection and the life, and that your dead hope, your dead dream, your dead desire, that is a place of deadness and dryness that you can't revive. You can't fix it. You have tried CPR. You have tried everything that you can do and you couldn't bring life into something that is dead. But yet you had the promises of God that are yes, amen, to those that believe. He told that to Martha. She says, oh, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. He was dead four days before he was raised from the dead. Oh, if only you had been here. We called on you. We told you that Lazarus, your friend, is sick. Why didn't you show up? Now he's dead. Now it's too late. Now it's past the point of possibility. And he tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Didn't I tell you if you would believe, you would receive? Well, I don't know if that, oh, I know that he's going to be raised someday. I know that God's going to move someday. I know that in the end, everything will work out. But what about this miserable in a between us? Then he say that we would be the repair of the preacher. To restore the paths to dwelling. In other words, you dwell when you're alive. You know, we are alive today. We have life today on earth. We are promised eternal life. We're promised that we will all be part of the resurrection of the dead. Ultimately, we stand before God in heaven, in bliss, in joy, no sickness, no defeat, no poverty, no problems, no arguments, no difficulties, everything solved. But you know what? We're not looking for a pie in the sky thing only. She knew that her brother would be raised on that day and she would see him again then. But the Lord said, hey, if you will believe, which is a current now thing, you will see. If you just believe, I am, I am, I am the resurrection. Not I will be. You know, yes, I'll raise him from the dead. Yes, he will stand before me in my presence forever. But here and now, is where I am the resurrection and the life. I am the living God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life in every dead area of your life. He's life now. So we believe in him for the impossibilities because if you can fix it, if you can change it, if you can affect it, if you can do it, you don't need God. You can do it all by yourself. You can change somebody, maybe by persuasion. You can fix something with your own hand that's broken. You can put a band-aid on somebody and fix them and medicate them. If you can do it, you don't need a miracle. A miracle is something that's past the point of possibility. And when God births that seed of faith in your heart, faith is the evidence of things not 
seeing. If you don't see it, it's not tangible. It's not yet material. It hasn't happened yet. Write the vision and wait for it. And when it happens, yet, yet. When it happens, it's going to happen fast because God wants the glory. If you could fix it, if you could repair it, if you could heal it, if you could medicate it, if you could change it, then you are not going to see a miracle from God. A miracle is what you can't see, but you believe him for. You can't hear it because it doesn't exist. You call in existence those things that aren't, and then you speak it as if it was. That, oh, I might not see it. I might not feel it. Oh, yes, it's impossible with man, but our God can do anything. Yes. And guess what? He also didn't say only that he can do anything. He said that he would give us everything that we would believe him for. Oh, I believe God and I prayed for them and they died. We can have faith in our head, but not only faith in our heart. Do you understand that? And then there's God's timing. Too. That's the truth. You have to believe it's a current thing. Not has been faith. Or this didn't happen for me, so I'm going to believe God for that. Hey, you know what? I remember telling the man on Easter Sunday, he was sitting way back there, and I wasn't preaching. I didn't have time to talk. I had a bunch of people coming to my house after di for dinner that were coming, and I had to cook dinner and serve it. I had to be home. I couldn't spend an hour with him after Easter Sunday. And I wasn't preaching. I wasn't going to do anything. So I was like, you can't go home like this. You're not going to see me again. You know, this is it for you. No. I can't. I can't let that man go to hell. But I don't have anything I can do. I'm not going to be preaching. I'm not going to be singing. I'm not going to be doing anything. I don't know what to do. Because I don't have time for him. You can't go home like that. You can't live like that. But we need to believe in God for now things. And now, if somebody doesn't believe in God, you believe in God. All my family's not saved. Didn't he say? If we believe in God, believe, then our households will be saved. He didn't say they are saved. He said they will be. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. But believing is a current thing. It's always a now thing. A now faith. There's the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And if you can't see it, you can't hear it, and you can't feel it, and you don't have it, and it's not material, and you, you can just get to the point where you're weary and well doing. You're weary and believing. You're re weary and waiting. But wait on God. Wait patiently on Him, and He will bring it to pass. He never said in His word that when we wait patiently on Him, trust in Him, and wait patiently on Him, that He will maybe bring it to pass, or could bring it to pass, or it's a possibility. No, He said He will bring it to pass. So the waiting is a hard thing to do. Being in the waiting room, waiting for the birthing of your child, or in the labor room when you're having the child, it's not a pleasant thing. But I'll tell you, when that baby comes forth, <laughs> the pain goes away. Isn't that true? The pain is gone, the tears are dry, and you're embracing a brand new life in your hands. And that's with every miracle. It takes pain, it takes waiting, it takes tears, it takes agony, 
It takes pacing the floor if you're the husband waiting for your wife to give birth. You know, you're sitting down and you're up and you're pacing and, and you're waiting and every little sound, is that the sound of somebody saying, my child was born, my wife is okay? You know, you're just pacing and waiting and, and just, but the minute you hear mother and child as well, you just got a brand new son. All that waiting is over, the pain is over, the problem is over, the tears are gone, the fear is dissipated. You've embraced that word that you're hearing all is well. Doesn't seem well when you're going through it. But we're going through it not to stay in it. We're passing through, passing through that valley of Baca that later on returns to a valley of blessing. No longer a place of tombs, no longer a place that's dead and dry and hopeless, but when he makes it a well of spring in your life. How can he take that cemetery, that place of death and hopelessness, that place of weeping and agony and loss and pain, and make it into a well spring. Well, that's because it's the work of the Lord. Because he's the resurrection and the life. That the things that you buried, the things that you gave up on, the things that you threw in the towel 10,000 times, You can turn that around for you. If you can come to the point of saying, okay, I don't have another towel to throw in. All the towels are thrown in. I've given up hope. I've given up. I don't have any faith in it. What am I going to do? I didn't believe. Well, believe now. Believe that your hope is a living hope. Believe that he's the resurrection and the life. Believe that he is changeless, that his word will come to pass for you. If you will believe, you will see his salvation. You will see his glory. You will see his resurrection power. You will embrace your miracle. Well, my faith wavered, it's too late. Are you still alive and breathing? Then change your mind, change your thoughts. Get him back on God and trust him. What you did yesterday, faith, faithlessness, fear, unbelief, you don't have to stay there. Throw in those towels of unbelief and fear and doubt and decide Today, I'm going to believe in God for my miracle because I can't do it. I can't change it. I can't fix it. Nobody can. God says, all things are possible to those that believe. Not that had believed. Not that should have believed or could have believed. If only they would have believed yesterday. Well, I failed the test. Oh, are you still in it? Are you still in the test, the trial, the tribulation? Obviously, it ain't over. So, if you got another day and you got another breath, you can change from fear to faith. You can change to doubt and unbelief. To believe in God. And as you wait on Him, is going to bring it to pass. Now, what you didn't do yesterday ain't what's going to happen today. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. Let's have faith today. Let's remember the vision. He's the resurrection and the life. On resurrection day, let's get out that old vision, get out that dream, get out that desire, get out that hope that seems to be dead. Walking through that 
Valley of Baca, all the dead, all of the tombs, I know that God's going to make it into a well of spring. No more death, here's the resurrection and the life springing forth in your life. Those things that are past hope, it is a living hope in God. You don't have to do it. Wouldn't it be nice if we would just come to the point where I can't. I can't do anymore. I can't fix it. I can't change. I did it. I did everything I can. I gave it my best shot. And it didn't work. Well, give it up. Give it over. Give it to God. And hold fast to that profession of faith. And he will bring it to pass. Never mind about yesterday. What about today? Just believe and you'll see his salvation, his glory, his goodness in the land of the living. Because we already know about the pie in the sky, the eternal life somewhere, some place of bliss and joy. What about now? What about now? Let's just believe and receive what God has promised us. Because his promises are yes and so be it. Those that believe.